So we've been looking the last couple weeks um, at how God is doing new things in our lives and in our world. We, we heard from Jeremy about how we're a new creation, and John last week talked about um, a new kind of leadership, servant leadership, that God calls us to. So this week we're going to continue looking at that and looking at a new kind of authority that God has given us. Now I feel a little bit like I'm cheating because this passage is actually one of the passages that was on that reading schedule for January for those of us who are going through the, um, the Bible in the year. And yesterday we talked about it for a while and I didn't actually tell you, those of you who were there, that I was preaching on this today. But I feel like I need to give a little bibliography and cite Dave and Jerry and Alice and Michelle and Jeremy. <laughs> so thanks guys for giving me some great ideas. <laughs> it was a, a communal sermon writing session yesterday morning, but no one else knew it. Um, so if you have a Bible with you or can reach one of the ones that are kind of sporadically around, um, turn with me to Matthew 10. Matthew 10. We'll start right at the beginning of the chapter. Give you a second to get there. It says, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and heal every disease and, thick and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who's called Peter and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Now freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting, and if the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Let's pray. God, we thank you for these words from Matthew and for the story of Jesus and his disciples. And we ask that you teach us more about you, teach us more about ourselves, and teach us what you would have us do as we go forward. In your name we pray. Amen. So this passage, I think, is um, one of those great stories that gives us an example of how we're called to be as God's disciples. You know, we can kind of put ourselves in the disciples' place so here we have Jesus kind of in the middle of his ministry, and he's talking to his disciples. He brings them together, these 12 kind of ragtag guys. We have tax collectors and fishermen, and really they were almost, they were just boys, 12 or 13 probably. And he comes to them and he says, okay guys, it's your turn. You've been with me while I've been doing ministry, and now you get to try it. You get to go out and do ministry because freely you've received, now freely give. But the most powerful part of all of this to me is that Jesus sits them down and says that he gives them authority. He gives them the authority to go out and do this, to go out and do ministry. He gives them authority so that what they were doing mattered and who they were and what they brought to the table mattered. I was thinking about this, this idea of authority and thinking through all the different jobs that I've had. I've, I've had some different kind of random summer jobs and those kinds of things from the time I was 15 on. Um, and really most of them, I had no authority. Now, of course, a 15-year-old would have a different kind of job than a 21-year-old or something, but I really, I really had no authority. I was just there to check off tasks. You know, I had one job when I was in high school at this little gift shop, and my job was to go in and to check with my boss and say, what am I doing today? And some days I'd be vacuuming, some days I'd be dusting, some days I'd do inventory. And it was just kind of whatever he needed to be done, I had to do it. My, my ideas didn't matter, my, my dreams or my thoughts didn't matter. I had no authority whatsoever. I was just doing tasks. Then the first job that I had that really I had some authority, still, I mean, I wasn't running the place, but 
I worked for the field education office at Fuller Seminary when I was there in California. This was the office that puts together internships for students um, throughout the seminary of all different kinds of degrees and that kind of thing. Um, and my boss gave me some authority. She put me on part of a team and I, my ideas mattered and I had the authority to go and take initiative and try new things and bring ideas to the table and even change the way some of the things the office was doing. So for example, I was given the task of um, kind of revamping the website for the Fuller Field Education Office. And I had no idea what I was doing. I was a music major in college, not a computer science major. But I'm a, I'm a quick study on the computer. I learned fast, so I was given this job. And it was really up to me how this would go. Since I had no clue what I was doing, it was up to me to figure out who did know what they were doing and set up meetings and learn from them and put something together and present it and then teach my coworkers to do what I did and I had all this authority on this project and it made a huge difference in how I worked and how I cared about what I was doing. It was so much more fulfilling to work with this and help the office become more efficient and communicate better as opposed to dusting or vacuuming in a little gift shop. This idea of authority was huge and essentially this is what Jesus was doing for the disciples. He was giving them authority so that what they thought and what they wanted and how they worked and interacted with people mattered. It was their job to do, Jesus is saying. And see, Jesus didn't have to do this. You know, sometimes I think we think of asking for help as kind of a sign of weakness. You know, I only ask for help if I'm not doing well or if I can't do something. But that's not what was going on here. Jesus was the Son of God. And he didn't need any help if he didn't want it, but he chose to give this authority to these 12 disciples. He, he chose to use them. Yesterday, Jerry used the word conduit, and I really liked it. It gives this really great picture. You know, just like a pipe is a conduit for water, or a wire is a conduit for electricity, bringing it out where it needs to go. Jesus gave authority to, this, to the disciples so that they were conduits of the gospel bringing the gospel out to where it needed to be. I love that picture. Thanks, Jerry. See, this is what happens when you come to my house. I steal your words. <laughs> um, so Jesus has given this authority to the disciples to join them, and he gives us the same authority today. So the question is, authority to do what? Right? We have authority, so what, if we're not doing anything with it? So there are three things. Here's a rare Harbor Church sermon with three distinct points. There are <laughs> three ways that God gives us authority that I want to draw out from this passage. First, we have the authority to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. Second, we have the authority to embody Jesus, to live like Jesus lived. And third, we have the authority to shake the dust off our feet. And we'll look at each one of those in turn. So first, we have the authority to preach the kingdom of God. We have the authority to tell the world the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have that authority. Each one of us has the authority to do that. That can be a very scary prospect. I'm up here doing it now, and I can tell you it can be a very scary prospect. <laughs> but I think sometimes we, we think that we're not trained enough, or we still have that flaw that we're working through, or that broken relationship that we haven't reconciled, or that addiction that we're struggling with. It's so easy to look at our lives and see all the ways that we fall short of Jesus and of the perfect example that he set out for us that we think there's no way that I could possibly do that now. But Jesus gave us the authority now as we are in the midst of whatever we're going through, in the midst of whatever problems we have. God gave us that authority now to go and to preach the gospel. God has given us that authority. Sometimes I think we fall into the trap that says we're not ready for that authority yet. We're not ready to share. We're not ready to, to put ourselves out there. It feels very vulnerable and scary, especially maybe in places like Seattle where people don't want to hear about the church or Jesus and they're skeptical of those kinds of things. But this passage shows us that Jesus gave us the authority, just like he gave the disciples the authority to go and to share boldly what God is doing in our lives and in his church. You have that authority. Each one of us does. 
So that's the first one. Second, we have the authority to embody Jesus, to live as Jesus lives. And there are all kinds of things we could talk about with this. There are a bunch of them in this passage that really struck me. But the first thing that I noticed is that Jesus tells his disciples to go out to the towns and the villages and to do what? To preach the gospel, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, cleanse people of leprosy, and to drive out demons. So this is chapter 10 of the book of Matthew. And if you were to take out your Bible and flip through chapters 1 through 9, you would see, well, first you'd see the Christmas story, but then you would see (laughs) Jesus preaching the kingdom and healing the sick and raising the dead and cleansing those with leprosy and driving out demons. This whole list of things that Jesus calls the disciples to do are exactly what Jesus had been doing up until this point. In other words, Jesus is saying, you've seen what I do, you've seen how I live, you see how God's kingdom is being present on the earth, and now it's your turn. You go and bring healing and life and preach the gospel. We have the authority and the the gift to be able to embody Jesus and to live like he lived. All this time, as Jesus had been doing these miracles and preaching these sermons, he, he hasn't just been doing them for show. He hasn't been just doing them for their own sake or because he can. One of the reasons he's been doing them is to give the disciples a model of how to live as his people, how to live as God's saved and chosen people in him. And we have that same model. When the disciples watch Jesus or when we read about him or experience him in our own lives, we are given a model of how to live and an example to follow. So Jesus gave us this authority to live as he lived and do ministry as he did ministry. But Jesus also knew that the best way for us to get to know him and get to know the Father in heaven is through, through the embodiment of that faith, the embodiment of that truth. In other words, our faith isn't just some idea we can know in the abstract. Jesus Christ isn't something we can know on principle. Jesus Christ was a person who lived and died and rose again. Our relationship to God is personal and it's real. It's not some theory in the abstract. So we're called to be these witnesses to each other. Just as the disciples were witnesses of Jesus Christ and shared with the world, we now are witnesses to each other and to the worlds around us. And that's what God's authority gives us the chance to do. Plus, the gift of all of this is that we do it together. This is the gift of the church. You know, even Jesus in his own ministry didn't go out all by himself. He brought 12 friends along with him. He didn't do it alone. And now here, when he's sending out the disciples to go and to do ministry in the towns and the villages, he didn't send them out all by themselves. He gave them a partner. He sent them out two by two. And so this is why we come together as Harbor Church. This is is why it's so important that we're in this together. We don't believe and we don't do ministry and we don't have faith just in some little bubble. We do it together. And we don't come to church just to hopefully hear some good stories or to sing that song that we liked that we heard on the Christian radio station or watch Jeremy play guitar. We don't come for those reasons. We come because we're in it together. That's what the church is for. And that's the gift that God gives us. So finally, we have the authority to shake the dust off of our feet. And I have to admit, I love this, and it makes me cringe a little bit, and I'll explain why. So Jesus tells his disciples to go into a house, and if the house receives them, then great, you're in, keep going, you're doing great. (laughs) But then he says, if you go to a house or to a person and they don't welcome you, or if they persecute you, just shake the dust off your feet and move on. And there's something freeing in that, I think, but also for me, it really, it, it makes my body tense up. It makes me cringe a little bit just because of how I'm wired. So I think, I think I've told you before that I really like personality tests, like Myers-Briggs and those kinds of things. And one that I come back to all the time is called Strength Finders. 
I've probably talked about it before, um, but this is a test that shows you what your top five strengths are, meaning the things that kind of are your driving forces and your personality and things that you're really good at. So one of mine is called harmony. And this means basically I want everyone to like each other all the time. <laughs> Just to be happy and to work together. And so one of the things that <laughs> Susie's raising her hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Sheila. So um, one of the things that um, I think that I'm good at is finding ways to navigate different personalities and finding compromises to make so that we can work together and at least be not in conflict, if not happy. But then every strength, of course, has a dark side, right? So part of this harmony thing, what it does to me, is I can be really sensitive when that doesn't happen. When people aren't happy, or when they're in conflict, or when someone doesn't like me, or when someone disagrees with something I'm really passionate about, when those things happen, I can be really sensitive. So when Jesus says, if someone doesn't agree with you, if someone isn't welcoming you, shake the dust off my, off my feet, I just cringe, because that means someone might not like me. <laughs> it means that as we go and as we share the gospel and do ministry in our neighborhoods and in our relationships, we will run up against opposition, and there will be conflict, and there will be people who might ridicule us or disagree with us or be offended by what we have to say, and that little harmony piece in me just hates that idea. But what Jesus said is when that happens, just move on. Just shake the dust off your feet and go somewhere else. And who knows what seeds have been planted in the meantime. So my favorite part about this, though, is that there's a story in the book of Acts where this actually works. So if any of you are skeptical, there's proof <laughs> that it works. Um, in Acts 13, it's kind of at the end of the story about Paul and Barnabas. If you know the story of Paul and Barnabas, they were apostles in the early church, and they went all over the place sharing the gospel and healing people and doing the things that Jesus is telling the disciples to do here. So in Acts 13, verse 49, if you're following along, says, The word of the Lord spread through the whole region where Paul and Barnabas were. But the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city and they stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. Talk about conflict, right? So they shook the dust off their feet and went on to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. When they met with persecution, they just shook the dust off their feet and went on to another city. But not just that, they were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. How freeing is that to be able to just move on? It reminds me of, there was a saying my mom would always say when I was little and other kids would be mean or say something senseless and she'd just say, just be like a duck in the water and let it roll off your back. <laughs> That's exactly what Jesus is saying, I think. Just shake the dust off your feet and move on and let the Holy Spirit take care of whatever will happen next. This is the authority that God gives us. So if any of you are like me and the thought of conflict or um, persecution or disagreement or even someone just not liking you very much, if that's enough for it to make you stop <laughs> from even trying, take heart. Because Jesus even gave us a way to deal with that kind of conflict. As we go and as we share the gospel and reach out and embody Christ, we don't have to worry about who might reject us or who might say, who are you to talk about the gospel? Who are you to talk about Jesus? Because we have been given the authority and a calling from the God of all things to go and to preach the gospel and to bring healing and life to the people around us. And what's interesting is I've been thinking about this passage. Jesus kind of takes away all of our excuses, doesn't he? He kind of takes, takes everything away. He says, I give you authority, and I'll, sh I'll show you what to do. You've seen how I do it. Just follow me. And when problems arise, I've even given you a conflict management strategy. We've got no excuse left. God calls us and has empowered us 
to go out and do his ministry. So yes, God is up to new things. And God has given us this new kind of authority to go and to preach the gospel and even to shake the dust off our feet when we have to. So instead, we can be filled with the joy and the power of the Holy Spirit as we go. Amen? Amen. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for this gift and for this calling that you've given us. Lord, we ask that you um, empower us and make us bold to follow your calling and to go with this authority and the knowledge that you are with us and you've shown us what to do. In your name we pray. Amen.